we can have a massive, roaring lunar industry that wanes to nothing but a faint shimmer after dark. The only things that need continuous power throughout the long lunar night are those machines that keep spaces habitable to humans. Since nuclear reactors are capable of providing continuous power, it makes sense to use them for this purpose, especially as rockets get bigger and reactors get smaller. If launching nuclear reactors to the moon proves to be too costly, politically or bureaucratically, then the second best option is to use fuel cells, which have higher energy densities than batteries. But both options have to be imported from Earth, which limits their scalability and increases their cost. I don't like tourists as much as the next conceited local, but a shitty tourism market is the easiest thing we can use to drive meaningful amounts of capital to the moon. Tourism is a way to get a market on the moon, a foothold. The market is our ice pick, and we sink the tourist covered tip of it into the moon to hold us there. While there's no doubt I'll be the first to beg my wife's boyfriend to buy me a ticket to tour the moon, the moon is no tropical paradise. So its long-term potential as a major vacation destination is probably more akin to that of Death Valley than Maui. But the moon doesn't need to have beaches to be useful. Its utility is derived from the fact it's rich in materials and orbits the Earth. The moon is a giant ball of feedstock material for satellite, ship, and station creation. We can use it to create the giant stations that become vacation destinations. So during the early phases of lunar development, from zero to one, importing continuous energy sources in the form of nuclear reactors or fuel cells makes sense. At this stage, our lunar economy may be 90% human-oriented. Tourism. Most energy and efforts going into the construction of habitable shelters. But as we continue to develop and shift our focus towards a manufacturing-based economy, since humans are the most expensive things, the labor scale should tip drastically in favor of machines. By the time we are constructing a mass driver to launch tons of material into orbit from which we can construct large stations, our lunar economy should be more than 90% machine. So we do not need to scale our human-oriented economy nearly as large as our machine industry. And there is no reason our machines need to run at night. Although not as glamorous as nuclear rockets or mass drivers, this is one of the most important discussions we can have, perhaps tied with metallurgy. Energy matters as much as mass. The domestically created, in situ resource utilized solutions we discuss today will dictate how effectively we are able to scale tomorrow, how quickly we reach our goals. So with all that being said, there are two main ways of turning the sun's energy into electricity to power our ever-growing, kilometer-consuming lunar industry, photovoltaic solar panels and solar thermal power stations. I originally wanted this video to be about both, and then end with a comparison of the two. But solar cell production is so involved that by the time I was done drafting this video, I realized it would be better to split it into two parts, so our current discussion will be on solar cells and the next video will be on solar thermal power solutions. Solar cells convert sunlight into electricity using the photovoltaic effect, which involves freeing an electron from blah blah boring. Look, it's 2024. You should know how solar cells work by now, and if not, then learning it must have not been in your horoscope. So let's just chalk it up to magic, because I'm not going to cover the entire atomic process, since that would be an entire video on its own and I have to keep my algorithmic overlords happy with a high retention rate. And honestly, knowing the exact atomic mechanisms that make this work isn't really essential for this discussion. What we need to know are the basic solar cell components and how they're made. Until the early 1990s, space-based solar arrays were made of crystalline silicon. However, since the 90s, gallium arsenide-based solar cells have been used as they offer higher efficiency and degrade more slowly in the radiated space environment. But on the moon, we have endless amounts of silicon and basically no gallium or arsenic, so it makes sense to go back to a silicon-based cell design. Silicon cells have a positive side and a negative side, a p-type and an n-type created by doping one side of the semiconductor with elements that add extra electrons to one side, 
making it negative, and doping the other side with elements that create holes, making it positive. In between these positive and negative layers, there is a neutral zone made of a highly pure undoped layer of intrinsic silicon whose purpose is to enhance light absorption and carrier collection. So it's a silicon sandwich, a hole filled positive layer, a neutral intrinsic layer, and a negative electron filled layer. This is the PIN or PIN architecture. We need to sandwich this silicon sandwich with conductors so we can extract that magical electricity. Adding a conductive contact to the bottom of the cell is easy. This can just be a metal foil attached to a wire. But adding a conductive contact to the top is harder because metal tends to block light. So we have two options. We can either punch a ton of holes into the metal foil contact so that light can get through, which is what a nanowire grid mesh contact is, or if the gods are good, we can find some super magical conductive material that is also see-through, a transparent conducting uh, thing. Turns out we have a few things like that, and most of them are certain oxides. So we typically call this top contact a TCO for transparent conducting oxide. However, since conductive polymers, metal grids and networks, carbon nanotubes, graphene, nanowire meshes, and ultra-thin metal films can be used as well, it's probably more accurate to call this part a transparent conducting electrode, but I'm going to keep calling it a TCO. Then we just need wires, something to carry our electricity away from the cell and into our entropic war machines, and a cover glass to protect the cell from dust and rain and greasy fingers, the raw solar wind, and bird poop. So we need to run through each of these components and see what options we have to make them on the moon. A lot of the insights of this video are coming from a 2005 paper by Dr. Jeffrey Landis, whose work has been featured on this channel before. I swear, every time I'm at a dead end deep in the research rabbit hole, my saving grace ends up being some 20 year old paper by Dr. Landis. At this point, I think it's only fair to name Dr. Landis the first official patron saint scientist of this channel. Inamine Patre Lorem Epsom Santorini. Alright, the first thing we need to do is decide on the kind of silicon we'll be using. Monocrystalline, polycrystalline, or amorphous. Most solar panels as we know them today are made from crystalline silicon, where the silicon has a well-organized crystalline lattice, allowing electrons to move smoothly through the cell facilitating higher energy conversion efficiencies compared to the other structures. We'll call it CSI for short. CSI cells are made using the crystal growing production process Szochralski. in which a small seed crystal is dipped into high purity molten silicon and then slowly pulled upwards while rotating. As it is drawn out, the material solidifies into a controlled manner forming a cylindrical crystal, which is then cut into tiny disks that turn sunlight into electricity. See, I told you this shit's magic, we're literally using crystals. The first practical solar cells were developed at Bell Laboratories in 1954, and were made from crystalline silicon. While groundbreaking, these cells had very high production costs and low efficiencies, limiting their use to specialized applications, mostly space satellites. Two decades later, during the oil crisis of the 1970s, the world was shaken to its core as gasoline prices soared to unimaginable heights. This wasn't just an economic setback, it shattered the very cultural and spiritual fabric of society. The illusion of infinite growth, which had been the cornerstone of post-war optimism, evaporated overnight. People were struck by a harrowing realization. The dream of endless expansion and prosperity was just that, a dream. In its place, despair crept in, as fears of a bleak, resource-strapped future led to a collective crisis of purpose. The world mourned what it saw as the inevitable end of abundance. The influential voices of the Club of Rome warned of a post-growth reality where the planet's resources could no longer support an ever-growing population. Faced with this grim prophecy, many turned inward, giving into nihilism and hopelessness. Some even abandoned the idea of bringing new life into a world they believed would be ravaged by famine and environmental collapse. Birth rates plummeted as a generation lost faith in the future, fearing that their children would inherit nothing but scarcity 
and strife. The consequences of that crisis echo to this day, reverberating throughout our economic, social, and political systems, shaping a world that still grapples with the scars of those dark years. Kids these days are so ungrateful, so unaware of true hardship, they cannot even imagine what it was like to endure gas prices as high as 55 cents a gallon, which would be $3.97 in 2024 dollars. So $4 gas caused the demographic collapse. But I guess the silver lining is that this crisis of energy and identity spurred a ton of interest in government spending to develop alternative energy sources. In 1976, David Carlson and Christopher Ronsky at RCA Laboratories invented the amorphous silicon solar cell. The amorphous structure allows for the absorption of sunlight over a thin layer because the disordered arrangement creates numerous sites for light absorption. This means ASI cells can be made thinner and use less material, reducing production costs, and they can be deposited onto more substrates, including glass and plastic. And to top it all off, they can even be made flexible, allowing for us to make thin film solar cells that can be rolled and unrolled like a ribbon. But they are less efficient overall, typically between 3 and 7%, but they can get up to about 12%. Remember those cells on old calculators? These are made of amorphous silicon, and they can charge a device in even low light sources, such as those indoor fluorescent bulbs that baked the brains of millions of school children across the modern world's vast education industrial complex before LEDs and windows were invented. Amorphous silicon cells, or ASI cells, were rapidly adopted in consumer electronics during the 1980s and 1990s. Companies like Canon, Sharp, and Sanyo capitalized on this technology to produce solar-powered calculators, watches, and stuff. For the next few decades, given this massively renewed interest in solar cell technology, there was a ton of innovation across the board in both ASI and CSI tech. However, by the early 2000s, CSI began to close the gap in the solar market due to improvements in the crystal growing process which allowed for larger scale production of high purity, higher efficiency silicon wafers with fewer defects at much lower costs than before. In 2005, the Chinese government recognized the strategic importance of renewable energy and began subsidizing the shit out of domestic solar industry. Massive investments were poured into scaling up CSI production. Chinese companies like SunTech Power and Yingli Green Energy emerged as global leaders, producing CSI panels at unprecedented scales and lower costs. By the 2010s, the dominance of CSI was clear. The last major ASI solar cell manufacturer, ECD, declared bankruptcy in 2012, marking the end of ASI as a competitive technology. Finally, there's polycrystalline silicon, the always forgotten mild-mannered middle child. It's not cheap and flexible like ASI, nor is it beautifully structured and efficient like CSI. PSI is like a bunch of chunky crystals all jammed together, forever stuck somewhere in the middle. It's perfectly mediocre in every category. Efficiency, cost, performance. Just a solid 5 out of 10 across the board. For it to be worth the effort, our energy source needs to last long enough to return more than the energy invested in creating them. This is our most important metric energy returned on energy invested, and it is how we can evaluate the viability of stuff outside the bounds of a price setting market. In a consumer market, if something is two times the quality, but costs 10 times more money, is it worth it? Most people would say no. It is a bad deal. Similarly, if something generates two times as much energy as an alternative, but costs 10 times as much to produce, it is also a bad deal. Polycrystalline and crystalline cells have two to three times the efficiency of amorphous cells, but require about 100 times as much silicon per cell. Even if this weren't the case, crystalline silicon wafers don't work well at high temperatures like those encountered during the lunar day, and adding cooling systems would increase the production energy cost and complexity greatly. To top it all off, cell efficiency has exponential diminishing returns, which means it really, really matters, but only up to a certain point. The average solar energy received on the moon's surface is about 63% of the maximum possible solar energy, 
because the amount of solar energy received depends on the angle between the sun's rays and the panel's surface. To find this, we divide the diameter of the moon by half the circumference and get 0.63 or 63%. The sun's full power in space, unfiltered by an atmosphere, is 1,360 watts per square meter. So if a panel the size of one square meter on the moon is 10% efficient, its average electricity generation will be 10% of 63% of those 1,360 watts, or 85.7 watts. To generate one gigawatt of electricity, on average, we'd need 11.67 square kilometers of 10% efficient solar panels. At 5% efficiency, it'll require about twice as much space, 24 square kilometers, and about twice as many materials. At 4%, we need 30 square kilometers for one gigawatt. At 3%, we need 40. 2% is 60, and 1% is a massive 120. This immediately shows us that it is worthwhile to increase the efficiency of our solar panels effectively halving our required production energy and materials with each percentage point, but only up to a certain point. At 10% efficiency, we need 12 square kilometers. At 15%, we need just eight. The difference in surface area between a 20% and a 30% efficient panel is just three square kilometers, but the difference in effort is all the cutting edge material science research over the past two decades. So efficiency really matters, but only up to a point, and it seems like the optimal trade-off is between 5 and 10%, which is the exact range ASI cells fall into. We can improve efficiency up to about 30% by making each panel sun tracking, but this would require a motor and mount and sensor configuration for every panel, which would greatly increase the cost and complexity of deployment, and they'd need to be spaced out more so they're not in each other's shadows, increasing the total area, which is why we basically quit doing tracking for solar fields even here on Earth, where we make these tracking components in bulk. We do have tracking fields, but most of them are older, from a time when panels were much more expensive to produce, so juicing every last bit of efficiency really mattered. If we have the space and panels are cheap enough, it makes sense to just compensate with more panels, and we have a lot of space in space. So amorphous silicon makes the most sense because of its ease of creation and deposition. The fact that it is highly radiation resistant, and it works at high temperatures like those of the 120 degrees Celsius lunar day. For creating the solar cells, we need highly purified silicon, a minimum of 99.99% purity, which we can extract from lunar regolith using a number of different techniques outlined in the previous video on lunar metallurgy. But we know it's possible because both Blue Origin and Mana Electric have demonstrated this capability. Once we have highly pure silicon, we can dope it and create nanometer thick layers, or thin films, through plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition. We want to use plasma deposition as opposed to sputtering or basic chemical deposition because this process operates at low temperatures, which is ideal for sensitive substrates like thin aluminum foils, and for incorporating hydrogen to improve the film's electronic quality. We definitely want to add hydrogen to our ASI to create hydrogenated amorphous silicon, because the hydrogen will not only improve the deposition process, but also the electrical properties of the silicon by filling in any loose dangling bonds. As if that wasn't enough, adding hydrogen will also greatly increase the cell's radiation resistance and allow us to heal any damage via annealing. More on that later. Hydrogen availability on the moon, either from the soil or polar regions, is sufficient for these cells, but it can also be imported. To give you a sense of how little hydrogen we need, our thin film amorphous silicon cells will be 400 nanometers thick, so we'll need 0.4 cubic meters of silicon per square kilometer of solar cells, which would be 920 kilograms. Hydrogen is 28 times lighter than silicon, and would make up 10% of the cell's atoms, so 280 times less than 920 kilograms 
is 3.28 kilograms of hydrogen per square kilometer of solar cells. So importing just a single ton of hydrogen would allow us to make 304 square kilometers of solar cells. We can import this hydrogen in many different ways, including as food, as one ton of hydrogen can be found in about seven tons of potato chips. As for doping, the P-type can be doped with lunar abundant aluminum and the N-type can be doped with phosphorus, which unlike aluminum is quite scarce on the moon. But like hydrogen, it can be imported with a little bit going a long way. P-doping is typically on the order of about 0.02 atomic percentage points. Phosphorus is about as heavy as silicon, so 920 kilograms times 0.0002 equals 0.184 kilograms of phosphorus per square kilometer. That's basically a rounding error. And yes, we are doping the P-type with AL and the N-type with P. I'm sure that won't never get confusing at all ever. Aluminum and calcium metal are both relatively abundant conductors, so they are our candidates for both the bottom contact and the wiring interconnects. Often the bottom contact can be made reflective and be given a certain texture with the purpose of reflecting unabsorbed light back into the cell, thus increasing efficiency. This would be quite easy as all we need to do is add a pattern to the rollers during metal foil production. As for the top contact, light needs to pass through so it needs to be transparent while also being conducting. An aluminum nanowire mesh grid can be used and won't require imports, but it'll lower the cell's efficiency. This may be worth it to avoid needing any imports at all, but the TCO imports are not too extreme to be disregarded completely. A commonly used transparent oxide is zinc oxide and its molecular shape may actually provide some radiation protection, which is why it's used in sunblock. But there is almost no zinc on the moon, so it would need to be imported. But unlike our other current imports, phosphorus and possibly hydrogen, this zinc oxide isn't making up a tiny atomic percentage of one single part of our cell. Zinc oxide TCOs can range from 50 to 600 nanometers in size, but assuming 200 as a low end and 600 as a high end, we'd need to import between 1 and 3 tons of it per square kilometer of solar cells. This would represent the single largest constraint on our ability to scale. So I wondered if it might be possible to use aluminum oxide as the TCO, since again we have such a relative abundance of aluminum on the moon. But after a ton of searching, I wasn't able to find a clear answer. I had other questions too, like whether the deposition temps would be too high to deposit the silicon directly onto an aluminum foil substrate, and if so, would an iron aluminum alloy work instead? And what is the necessary intrinsic layer thickness? Did we need an anti-reflective layer? How essential is bottom contact texturing? What is the deposition distance, the substrate temperature, the gas ratio, the current and current waveform? Why does it hurt so bad when I pee and where do babies come from? So I reached out to a part-time solar cell material scientist, full-time playboy named Vedimir, who graciously answered every single one of these questions. Forget aluminum oxide as a TCO. It's corundum, which is extremely sturdy and requires insane energy to work with. Plus, at high temps like the ones encountered during deposition, aluminum tends to react with silicon. So, despite needing to import up to 3 tons per square kilometer, we may be better off using zinc oxide since it is known to work, has a massive research profile behind it, and might give our solar cells superior radiation resistance. But there is another option. Fluoride doped 10 oxide transparent conductive films, or FTOs, with a titanium oxide overcoat, which the researchers of this paper were able to use to increase the amorphous silicon cell efficiency by about 3%, which is quite significant. To do this, we need to import 10 and fluorine either on their own or as a pre-made FTO film that would be between 600 and 900 nanometers thick. Assuming we do import pre-made films, we'd need to import between 4 and 6 tons of them per square kilometer. But that is instead of the 1 to 3 tons we'd have to import with the zinc oxide alternative, so really it is just a 3 ton opportunity cost difference 
and I suspect that the up to 3% increase in efficiency would be worth it. This would be even less if we just import tin and a tiny amount of fluorine, which we might want to import for regolith refining anyway, and make the FTO film on the moon domestically. Glass making. This could be an entire video on its own, but we have to talk about it here because even radiation tolerant ASI cells with zinc oxides will require at least a thin protection layer or cover glass to keep high energy electrons and protons away, and this glass will need to be transparent. One of the benefits of using hydrogenated amorphous silicon cells, on top of their natural radiation resistance, is the ability to also reverse any radiation damage that is caused through a process called annealing. Basically, ionizing radiation degrades silicon cells by breaking atomic bonds, like cutting the strings of a net. But if you heat these cells up to about 130 degrees Celsius for a couple of hours, the broken bonds reform. Two papers, one co-authored by Landis, show very promising results for this process. The lunar daytime temp is 120 degrees Celsius, which very well may be enough. But if not, we can just warm them up an extra 10 degrees every once in a while. This heating has also been shown to reverse the Stabler-Ronsky effect, which I don't have time to fully go into, but basically it's an issue with hydrogenated amorphous silicon, which causes the cell to degrade slowly over time. So heat annealing our cells should fix the degradation from both this effect and the damage caused from radiation. There is a slight chance that annealing our cells every few days might reverse the degradation enough that we could potentially get away with not needing a protective cover at all, However, this hasn't been tested and it's unlikely that annealing would do anything to reverse the damage to the TCO or other components, so we're probably best off with at least a little cover glass and occasional annealing. The thickness of the cover glass can range between 10 to 500 microns, but space rated panels typically have a thickness of 100 microns. At this thickness, we would need 220,000 kilograms of glass per square kilometer. Although this 100 micron thickness is intended for a 15 year lifespan on satellites without annealing. Since we do have magic annealing healing ASI cells, we should be able to get away with much thinner cover glass, but exactly how much is impossible to know without testing and optimization. Here is a chart from that Landis paper, but I am not exactly sure I'm reading it right. I think it's saying that 1 micron stops 44 kilo electron volts of a 1 mega electron volt proton. If my interpretation is correct, then that means to stop 1 mega electron volt proton, we'd need about 23 microns of cover glass. Assuming we use just 20 microns and anneal every once in a while, we'll only need 44,000 kilograms of glass per square kilometer. This is much better, but it's still a lot. Again, glass making could be an entire video on its own, and we have several options, but the important thing to know is that to make glass, we need purified elements and high temperatures that are highly controllable. But we can do it, and we have made glass from straight lunar regolith in the lab on a number of occasions with success. Another option is to make fused silica, which as far as I know hasn't been made from regolith because of the extreme working temperatures and vacuum it requires. But on the moon, both extreme temperatures and vacuum are quite easy to come by, and fused silica has extremely good optical qualities, which is why it's often used in scientific instruments. So we have options. We have options for the cover glass and for the TCO and for the bottom contacts and for the wires, which is why Vetemir and I have put together this table of different options for moon-made solar cells, listing the relevant resources, components, needed imports, and pertinent information, which I've linked in the description for all to access. What needs to be done now is extensive terrestrial testing to figure out the best cell architecture using as many domestic resources as possible. I was able to find two companies currently working on this, Blue Origin with their Blue Alchemist program and Mana Electric based in Luxembourg. From what we can tell just based on their public releases, these are amorphous silicon cells with aluminum wiring and likely an aluminum bottom contact. Instead of a TCO, it appears they have opted to use a nanowire mesh grid, also aluminum, and they do have a cover glass. 
Their efficiency was not disclosed, so it may be very low, but these are just the first demonstrator products. Now, the last thing we need to discuss is deployment. The biggest advantage that solar cells should have over other approaches to generating electricity using solar energy is rapid, cheap, scalable deployment once you've established production. Here on Earth, we typically deposit wires and cells onto metal or plastic substrates to create rigid panels, but we can already see how even very thin cover glass films quickly add up to being extremely expensive. Our current design is deposited onto a foil backing, likely aluminum, and will have thousands, millions of tile-like cells that'll need to be wired together using aluminum strips. In 2002, Ignatiev and colleagues proposed the use of a sort of land crawler cell production rover, which would print solar cells made from lunar regolith directly onto melted lunar regolith. Then in 2005, Horton and colleagues improved upon the concept and even tested the ability to use melted, glassified regolith, basically obsidian, as an omic substrate. This could be done passively with the sun's heat using a large Fresnel lens on a rover, but it would be extremely slow. But just throwing them onto raw, unprepared regolith is also a problem because it's uneven and messy. I think we can find a solution in the middle leveled and tempered regolith. Not centered regolith, not melted regolith, just packed regolith, like a dirt road. This can be done with something like a big roller wheel at the front of a rover. Likely, the terrain would be prepped first, large boulders removed, soil leveled with the blade, then roller tempered to create a flat packed surface upon which a solar field will be laid. Thank you so much to the patrons who support this channel, and thank you for watching.